Good afternoon, everyone. I will start my presentation with some questions. So do you think Mars was a habitable planet in the past? Uh, how can we know that there was water in the Mars past? And what happened to it, to its atmosphere? And what is the importance of studying the sulfur brines on Mars, for example? So my name is Nicole. And these are some of the questions that we will explore today. And from Earth to Mars, understanding the sulfur brines across worlds. Uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Sanjay Song, Serhat Sabagan, and Dana Harimus. Let's go. So first, let's talk about the atmospheric evolution. Oh, my bad. Okay. So let's talk about the atmospheric evolution of Mars. Like Earth, Mars likely had a thick atmosphere early in its history, uh, primarily composed of carbon dioxide, wa water vapor, and nitrogen. So this atmosphere was generated by volcanic outgassing and impacts. However, Mars lacks a global magnetic, magnetic field, uh, which made its atmosphere vulnerable to solar wind stripping. So over time, charged particles uh, from the sun stripped away uh, of the Martian atmosphere, especially the, the lighter uh, elements like hydrogen. Additionally, uh, photochemical reactions driven by ultra violet light from the sun broke down atmospheric molecules, so ca causing the escape of uh, lighter ga gases like hydrogen and helium. As a result, Mars' atmosphere today is thin and mostly composed of CO2, about 95.3%, with traces of nitrogen, 2.7%, argon, 1.6%, uh, and very small amounts of oxygen, water vapor, and methane. So with this introduction, um, there are three important points to keep in mind about what makes a planet habitable. First, we have the, um, the energy source. So life needs six key elements, carbon, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. So Mars has carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. And we know there are microbes that can use CO2 as a source of carbon. Hydrogen is available too possibly in ice, but what about nitrogen? So, well, nitrogen uh, amounts on Mars are very low um, or almost non-existent, raising the question of whether there are sources of fixed uh, nit nitrogen uh, on the surface that could support biology, for example. And there is uh, also a tiny bit of oxygen uh, in the atmosphere. So then we have phosphorus, for example, and we know there is phosphorus in appetite, uh, a phosphate containing mineral commonly found in volcanic rocks uh, on Earth and also known to exist on Mars. So there is a source of phosphorus on Mars. And then we have finally the, um, the sulfur. So sulfates uh, such as magnesium sulfate have been found on Mars, which we, we will uh, discuss in more detail later. So Mars also contains uh, many other elements like magnesium, calcium, iron, potassium, um, sodium found in volcanic rocks, just like on Earth. Okay, so now the traces of past liquid water. So the surface of Mars has been uh, shaped and you can see that there are some uh, through the images that I will show you now. Uh, it's the, um, the proof that maybe it was uh, water in the past on Mars. So Mars today has a very dry surface with no liquid water because the atmospheric pressure is too low for water to stay liquid on the surface. However, um, there is a strong evidence that this wasn't always the case. In the distant past, Mars likely had much more like liquid water and it's possible that uh, liquid water still exists underground. So when we consider whether Mars could support life, it's clear that early Mars with its abundant liquid water uh, would have been more suitable for life than it, um, it is today. So we think that Mars essentially went through three main epochs. The early epoch uh, known as the Noachian uh, was a time when there was um, abundant uh, liquid water, which would have reacted with volcanic rocks. This created, um, this created environments uh, with a neutral pH or place where being formed. So then during the second part, the, during the Hesperian epoch, Mars began to dry up. 
So later in its history, interactions between sulfur dioxide from the volcanoes and liquid water were uh, produced acidic waters. And during this phase, many of Mars water bodies may become more acidic compared to its very early history. So finally, uh, in the last epoch, it's the Amazonian epoch, Mars uh, transitioned into what we see today, a very dry environment into um, uh, a very dry environment with no standing bodies of liquid water. And if there is any liquid water, it is likely confined to the deep subsurface. Sur so, however, there is some evidence that liquid water might still exist near the surface even today. So here you can see uh, some images showing fluvial landforms, which demonstrate that water was present on Mars in the past. Similarly, conglomerates, uh, a type of sedimentary rocks uh, that forms in uh, aquatic uh, environments, have been detected. The, similar the similarities are quite striking. Don't you think so? And well, here, uh, this is a rather stunning image of Jezero Crater in the northern hem hemisphere of Mars. It shows what appears to be a river flowing into an asteroid crater. Uh, it's a false uh, color image, the first one that you see here, uh, meaning some of these colors represent minerals like olivine and pyroxene, which are found in volcanic rocks, while others represent clays, uh, which are alteration products <clears throat> form when volcanic rocks uh, react with liquid water. And these kind of features have been found in many locations on Mars. The name is Delta. And on the other hand, you can see uh, a Delta formed on Earth and Spain. So these images uh, show uh, the similarities between the water, rock, soil interaction between uh, Mars and Earth. And well, another piece of evidence for the presence of water on Mars is the discovery of hydrated minerals, which form through um, the evaporation of brines. So this is where the study of brines becomes crucial for understanding the geochemical processes that occurred uh, on Mars uh, in the past. It's like traveling back in time. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, well, on Mars, brines um, formed when liquid water came into contact with um, saline minerals on the surface, such as chlorides and sulfates and other mores. Uh, this interaction uh, created saline solutions, and as the water evaporated, um, hydrated minerals were depos deposited, uh, providing evidence of uh, ancient geological processes and potential habitable uh, microenvironments in Mars past. So we don't see uh, liquid water on the surface of Mars, but we do see those minerals that have precipitated and are directly related to water contact. That is why this is, in, this is an important evidence that were, there was uh, water in the past on Mars. And now, what is the importance of studying sulfate brines specifically and not other type of brines? So because sulfur is abundant on Mars and sulfate brines suggest that liquid water was present on Mars in the past, the presence of sulfate minerals such as gypsum or epsomite often points to evaporative processes. Where water, was, uh, where wa water um, has evaporated and left behind the salts. So this information helps reconstruct the history of, of water on Mars, including the extent and duration of these liquid uh, water bodies. And by studying the sulfate brines on Earth, scientists can develop better models and technologies for future um, Mars missions, for example, including how to search uh, uh, signs of life and understanding the planet's uh, past hydrology. So now the origin of sulfates, let's break down the, the key mechanisms. So the first one is the evaporitic formation. So sulfates um, can form as the evaporites when groundwater or transient uh, surface uh, waters evaporate. So this process leaves behind sulfate salts similar to the way evaporates uh, form on earth, for example. Uh, then we have the acidic weathering 
Another source of sulfates is the acidic weathering of volcanic ash and clastic sediments. When Martian volcanic ash interacts with acidic conditions, it leads to the formation of sulfate minerals. Then we have the uh, hydrothermal uh, alteration. So sulfate brines can also result from hydrothermal activity. Hot mineral rich fluids uh, interact with sulfur rich bedrock. Uh, then we have the aqueous cementation. And finally, uh, the last one explained that sulfates uh, can form through the weathering of dust within ancient ice deposits. And as these massive ice deposits melt or sublimate, the dust trapped inside uh, undergoes weathering, releasing the sulfate ions and forming new sulfate minerals. And then we have uh, some explanations for the uh, Gale Crater. That uh, the main the main thing is that the, it has wet and dry cycles that conducted to evaporate formation. Okay, see. Uh, okay, um, the map you're looking at here is a topographic map. So the blue areas represent the lowest regions like Valles Marineris, while the red areas indicate the highest regions. As you can see, there is uh, the, the Olympus uh, Mons, which is about three times taller than Mount Everest on Earth. <laughs> and well, the sulfates, as you can see, here um, are abundant in Valle Marineris, uh, Margariti Terra, near the northern cap in the in the circumpolar dune field, and uh, cratered and intra crater deposits such, such as uh, the Gale Crater. And here you can see the orange areas, which um, indicate sulfate minerals in Gale Crater, and the yellow areas represent gypsum deposits. Okay, evaporation through AQ36. So the AQ36 uh, is a software that was used uh, in this, on this internship to create a geochemical models of water evaporation. I used data uh, from seawater, but with a twist. The sulfate value was increased tenfold in one of the examples, as you can see with the blue uh, graph. Um, and we also uh, uh, had to adjust the magnesium value to maintain the proper chemical balance and to be able to run the code uh, through a, a, AQ36. So in the first graph, um, with normal seawater uh, concentrations, we see that higher sulfate concentrations uh, lead to increased acidity. So what happens when we increase the sulfate concentration, oh, I'm sorry, tenfold? Um, during the, the evaporation, we observe that the concentration of sulfates actually decreases, which allows uh, carbonates and bicarbonates to increase the pH of the aqueous solution. In the other, uh, in the other graph, um, something interesting happens uh, at, in the inflection point. It's possible that a mineral is precipitating here which would mean that uh, the chemistry before and after this point could be very different. This is something we expect to see in sulfate-rich uh, waters. The goal of this evaporation models was to observe these chemical divides, and I'm still figuring out why this is happening, but it's clear, but it's a clear example of this divide in action. So now let me explain what a chemical divide is. I can't. Hold on. Okay, got it. So, um, the well, the chemical divide, uh, the concept is the is when the precipitation of a, a specific evaporite minerals alters the relative concentration of the remaining ion, uh, ions uh, in the solution. So it can be traced back to the initial chemistry of the evaporating fluid. So the arrow above that you can see indicates the decreasing concentration of bicarbonates and sulfates, as well as um, key minerals found on, min on Mars, such as magnesium, iron, and calcium. Following this, we observe five distinct um, families. Each difference, uh, each one uh, by the, it's varying by the amounts of iron and calcium in relation to bicarbonate. And in the case of families D and E, uh, in relation to sulfate as well. 
So the results you can see here with the last um, concentrations of each minerals. And then, well, to conclude, by analyzing the mineralogy and the chemistry of these evaporites, we can infer the characteristics of the water, including its pH, salinity, and ionic composition. So understanding these properties provides crucial insights into the environmental conditions on early Mars, including the planet's, uh, the planet's potential to support life. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Yay, great job. That was wonderful. So yeah. we have some time for questions. Um, that was our last live talk, so we can discuss as much as we want to, really. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or ask a question in the chat. Um, Itziar says, hey, Nicole, I know you mentioned it, but I'd like to know more about maybe a small example of how chemical divide works. Oh, yeah, sure. So one ion typically becomes depleted uh, in the solutions. I mean, it precipitates into a solid mineral while another becomes more concentrated. So this shows which mineral will precipitate next. So in this case, if you want, I can share my screen. So it's going to be better for you to understand the chemical divides. Let me share again. Mm. I don't know why I cannot go back. Hold on. Okay, so for example, I was talking about the five families. Uh, these are families from Mars, the chemical divides from Mars that they are very different from Earth. And uh, as you can see, for example, if we start here with gypsum, for example, gypsum precipitates. If we have calcium poor and sulfate rich, we will have two options. We will have the iron and sulfate and the sulfate, uh, well, iron uh, higher than sulfate and sulfate uh, higher than iron. So in any case, you will see that this will be precipitate, this will be uh, precipitating other type of minerals. So for example, in this case, if we choose the iron higher than sulfate, we will see the sulfate poor magnesium, iron, calcium, chloride rich. But in case that we have sulfate, for example, higher than iron, we will see, for example, uh, minerals uh, poor in iron, but rich in sulfate. And then we have another chemical divide and this con continues. Uh, so this is just a, a brief uh, explanation of the chemical divide. So it's just, in other words, it's like, like you can divide a mineral into parts. No, so you can have many examples depending on uh, the concentrations of the cations and the ions. So it depends. But yeah, that's a general explanation for the chemical device. We have one question from Clayton, it looks like. Uh, Clayton says, you mentioned that the surface of Mars presents acidity. What is the reason for this? Where does it come from? Okay, yes, about the acidity, uh, it's it's related with the uh, atmosphere first, the CO2 atmosphere and the volcanic gases. That's the, the main source of acidity on Mars. 